In this presentation, we will take a look at 3rd Nephi, chapters 20 through 26. There's a lot of doctrine in this, so this may be a little longer than the normal, but hopefully this will help you with some of the doctrines and principles in these chapters. 3rd Nephi, 20 through 26. So let's begin with 3rd Nephi, chapter 20. 20 verse 1, we should continually pray in our hearts. After their prayer had ended, the Savior gave the Nephites important counsel to keep a prayer continually in their hearts. Elder Russell M. Nelson, a quorum of the Twelve Apostles, similarly declared, Prophets have long told us to pray humbly and frequently. Prayers can be offered even in silence. One can think a prayer, especially when words would interfere. End of quote. President Boyd K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught, quote, learn to pray. Pray often. Pray in your mind. Pray in your heart. Pray on your knees. Prayer is your personal key to heaven. The lock is on your side of the veil. End of quote. Chapter 20, verses 3 through 8, Jesus administers the sacrament again. Our Lord again blessed bread and wine as a sacramental ordinance for his Nephite followers, this time, Mormon adds, providing them in a miraculous fashion. That is, he provided the bread and the wine in a miraculous fashion. And once again, the Spirit is poured out upon this people as it is on all who, in this ordinance, gratefully ponder the wondrous gift of the body and blood of the beloved Messiah. Again, we see the pattern of the Savior giving the sacrament first to the disciples, and then the disciples gave to the multitudes. That's the pattern. Christ will first give revelation to his leaders of the church, and then they will give revelation concerning the church as a whole to us. Chapter 20, verse 9. They were filled with the Spirit. Elder Dallin H. Oaks counseled to those brothers and sisters who may have allowed themselves to become lax in this vital renewal of the covenant of the sacrament, I plead in words of the First Presidency that you come back and feast at the table of the Lord and taste again the sweet and satisfying fruits of fellowship with the saints. Let us qualify ourselves for our Savior's promise that by partaking this sacrament, we will be filled, which means that we will be filled with the Spirit. That Spirit, the Holy Ghost, is our comforter, our direct direction finder, our communicator, our interpreter, our witness, and our purifier, our infallible guide and sanctifier for our mortal journey towards eternal life. End of quote. Uh, 3 Nephi 20, verses 11 through 13. Isaiah wrote of the gathering of Israel. Jesus commanded Nephites, as well as us, to search the words of Isaiah. As we see the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecies, we will know that God is keeping his covenant with the house of Israel. The doc but the Bible dictionary explains that the bulk of Isaiah's prophecies deal with the coming of the Redeemer teaching of the Redeemer and the gathering of Israel are closely related. God scattered Israel because they sinned and rejected him. The atonement, however, provides them a chance to be reconciled to God, to have their sins remitted, and to be gathered to him both spiritually and physically. The Savior spoke of fulfilling his Father's covenant to gather scattered Israel, verses 12 and 13, who in Israel... And why were they scattered? The Lord promised Abraham that his descendants would have the gospel and the priesthood, and that through them all the families of the earth would be blessed. This promise was renewed with Abraham's son Isaac, with Isaac's son Jacob, and with Jacob's descendants, the children of Israel. Sadly, the children of Israel sinned against God and forfeited these promises. Eventually, in fulfillment of God's warning, they were expelled from their promised land and scattered throughout the earth. However, the Lord has not forgotten them. Heavenly Father promised that they would one day be taught the gospel and gather to the lands of promise. The promise is part of the covenant he made that he would gather and teach the children of Israel. President Spencer W. Kimball explained that by accepting the gospel covenant, 
we comply with the law of the gathering. Quote, now the gathering of Israel consists of joining the true church and their coming to a knowledge of the true God. Any person, therefore, who has accepted the restored gospel and who now seeks to worship the Lord in his own tongue with the saints and the nations where he lives has complied with the law of the gathering of Israel and is heir to all the blessings promised to the saints in these last days. End of quote. In the early days of the church, leaders encouraged converts to join with the saints in central places such as Ohio, Missouri, Illinois, and Utah. Today, the saints are instructed to build up the church where they live. President Dieter F. Uchtdorf of the First Presidency explained, In our day, the Lord has seen fit to provide the blessing of the gospel, including an increased number of temples in many parts of the world. Therefore, we wish to reiterate the long-standing counsel to members of the church to remain in their homelands rather than immigrate to the United States. As members throughout the world remain in their homelands, working to build a church in their native countries, great blessings will come to them personally and to the church collectively. End of quote. Elder Douglas L. Callister of the Seventy described the purpose and process of Israel's gathering in the last days. Quote, Our present gathering is primary spiritual, not geographic. Christ declared that in the latter days he would establish his church, establish his people, and establish among them his Zion. As he established his church in our day, people can be taught <clears throat> excuse me, the gospel and be brought to the knowledge of the Lord their God without leaving their homes. In contrast to the pronouncement during the early days of the restored church, our leaders have decreed that now the gathering should take place within each land and among every tongue. Our need to be physically near large numbers of saints is less than it was a century ago because church magazines and satellite transmissions bridge distance and time, creating a sense of oneness throughout the entire church. All have access to the same keys, ordinances, doctrines, and spiritual gifts. End of quote. Chapter 20, verses 16 through 17. A remnant of the house of Jacob. Go forth, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. Again, we suggest that the context for this unusual phenomenon appears to be millennial. When, at what point in time, will all the enemies of the Israel be cut off or destroyed? Surely it shall be when the Savior returns to reign as the second David, the King of Israel. See 3 Nephi 21.13. This metaphor of a lion among the sheep takes place in the day when such things as witchcraft, soothsaying, idolatry, immorality, priestcraft, lying, and deceits are all destroyed and done away. When will such things be done away? Clearly, after the Lord comes and the millennial day has begun. It would seem that the image of the remnant of Israel rending its Gentile enemies is symbolic of Israel's ultimate victory over its foes, a victory which comes when the Savior returns and the wicked are destroyed. Chapter 20, verse 18, I will gather my people together. Without question, the greater work of gathering is ahead. Though multi-millions shall yet embrace the religion of Jesus Christ, the religion of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all before the end of the world or the destruction of the wicked, the gathering of Israel during the thousand years of peace will be of a magnitude that is difficult for us in our present state to conceive. We have barely yet, brothers and sisters, seen the gathering of Israel. There will come a day during the millennium where it will be astounding and we will be astonished. Chapter 20, verse 19, I will make thy horn iron, and I will make thy hooves brass. These are symbolic expressions which are meant to typify might and power, the power of Christ and his destroying angels to cleanse the earth of all wicked persons and all wickedness, that might, the might to beat in pieces those persons who have rejected the greater light of the gospel and glory in their perversity. Chapter 20, verse 20, the sword of justice shall fall upon all the nations of the Gentiles. We see from this verse that God's justice will not be limited to some sort of vigilant, vigilante group of Lamanites attacking America. 
Rather, the sword of justice wielded by the Almighty shall fall upon the wayward and rebellious of all nations. The Lord explained that until the coming of the Son of Man in glory, there will be foolish virgins among the wise, and at that hour, that is, at the time of the second advent, cometh an entire separation of the righteous and the wicked. And in that day will I send mine angels to pluck out the wicked and cast them into unquenchable fire. For the time speedily cometh, saith the Lord God, shall cause a great division among the people, and the wicked will be destroyed. That should be destroyed, not he. Sorry for the typo. And he will spare his people, yea, even if so be that he must destroy the wicked as by fire. Who will be destroyed? There's the change. <clears throat> chapter 20, verses 22, and then chapter 21, 23 through 29, the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem is a center place, a center city, which shall be built up and established as the headquarters of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Its location will be Independence, Jackson County, Missouri. We believe that Zion, the New Jerusalem, will be built upon the American continent. The Tenth Article of Faith declares, Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught, quote, Zion, the New Jerusalem, on American soil. And we hasten to add, so also shall there be a Zion, Zions in all the lands, and New Jerusalems in the mountains of the Lord, in all the earth. But the American Zion shall be the capital city, the source where the law shall go forth to govern all the earth. It shall be the city of the great king. His throne shall be there, and from there he shall reign gloriously over all the earth. End of quote. Chapter 20, verse 22, God will dwell in our midst. While teaching the Nephites about Zion or the New Jerusalem, the Savior promised that he would be in the midst of his people. The Lord used a similar phrase in the Doctrine and Covenants, quoting section 38, But behold, verily, verily, I say unto you that mine eyes are upon you. I am in your midst, and you cannot see me. But the day soon cometh that ye shall see me, and know that I am. For the veil of darkness shall soon be rent, and he that is not purified shall not abide the day. Wherefore, gird up your loins, and be prepared. End of quote. The promise that God will come in the midst of Zion can have reference to him being in the temple in Zion, the new Jerusalem, and that all the pure in heart that come into the temple shall see God. Chapter 20, verse 25, ye are the children of the prophets. This is the Savior's testimony, his sure word, that the Lehites are pure descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are heirs of the blessings of the prophets, who also descended from the patriarchs. The phrase, ye are the house of Israel, Jesus' statement here, as with patriarchal declaration of lineage in general, is just what it purports to be, a literal statement about blood descendants from the ancient patriarchs. It is neither metaphorical nor mystical. It is true. The phrase, the covenant which the Father made with your fathers. The gospel covenant, the new and everlasting covenant, has been in existence from the days of Adam. Its rights and privileges and responsibilities continue from Adam through the antediluvian patriarchs, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. From Noah, the blessings of the gospel continued, albeit through periods of apostasy and restoration, through ten generations and until the days of Abraham. God renewed his covenant, the gospel covenant, with Abraham. Because Abraham was a restorer, because he was a dispensation head, because more scriptural information regarding the terms and conditions of the covenant are given in God's dealings with Abraham than anywhere else in Holy Writ, and because Abraham received the covenant and lived worthy of its consummate privileges, even exaltation and godhood, because of these things we have come to call the covenant which God made with his people, the Abrahamic covenant. In that covenant, God promised Abraham four things. One, the gospel. Two, the priesthood and its ministry. Three, eternal life and the continuation of the family unit. And four, a land of inheritance. 
Elder Russell M. Nelson explained that the covenant the Savior was referring to and how this applies to us, quote, the covenant that the Lord made with Abraham and reaffirmed with Isaac and Jacob is of transcendent significance. We also are also children of the covenant. We have received, as did they of old, the holy priesthood and the everlasting gospel. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are our ancestors. We are of Israel. We have the right to receive the gospel, blessings of the priesthood, and eternal life. Nations of the earth will be blessed by our efforts and by the labors of our posterity. The literal seed of Abraham and those who are gathered into his family by adoption receive these promised blessings, predicated upon acceptance of the Lord and obedience to his commandments. End of quote. Chapter 20, verses 27 through 28. A vital part of the realization of the promises made to Abraham is the spread of the gospel through missionary efforts to all parts of the world. In our day, as people, including Israelite Gentiles and even pure Gentiles, hear the message of the restoration, as they receive by the power of the Holy Ghost the witness of its truthfulness, as they gather into the church in the kingdom of God, the Lord covenant with the ancient fathers is being brought to pass. Then the Holy Ghost will be poured out upon the Gentiles, which blessing will make the Gentiles mighty unto the scattering of God's people, the house of Israel. The scattering appears to be in reference to the Lamanites. However, if the Gentiles accept the gospel and then turn against it, God will turn their iniquities upon their own heads. Chapter 20, verse 29, Prophecy Concerning the Restoration of Jerusalem The restoration of the tribe of Judah and the city of Jerusalem appears as an important theme in Old Testament and the Book of Mormon prophecy. In our dispensation, the Lord has declared, Let them, therefore, who are among the Gentiles flee unto Zion, and let them who be of Judah flee unto Jerusalem, unto the mountain of the Lord's house. Doctrine and Covenants 133, 12-13 Concerning the restoration of Judah, the prophet Joseph Smith testified, quote, Judah must return, Jerusalem be rebuilt, and the temple and water come out from under the temple, and the waters of the Dead Sea be healed. It will take some time to rebuild the walls of the city and the temple, and all this must be done before the Son of Man will make his appearance, end of quote. So there is yet to be a temple in Jerusalem and the Dead Sea healed into a freshwater lake. Those are signs yet still to be fulfilled before Christ comes. Chapter 20, verses 30 through 33. It shall come to pass that the time cometh when the fullness of my gospel shall be preached unto them. These verses pertain to the ultimate gathering of the Jews, who are also the Lord's covenant people, a gathering which shall not take place on a grand scale until the Savior's second coming. When the Savior visits Jerusalem, President Brigham Young observed, and the Jews look upon him and see the wounds in his hands and in his side and in his feet, they will then know that they have persecuted and put to death the true Messiah, and then they will acknowledge him, but not until then. They have founded they have confounded his first and second coming, expecting his first coming to be a mighty prince instead of a, as a of as a servant, they will go back by and by to Jerusalem and own their Lord and Master. End of quote. The Jews shall believe, begin to believe in Christ before he comes the second time. Some of them will accept the gospel and forsake the traditions of their fathers. A few will find ill will find ill Jesus the fulfillment of will find will find in sorry i apologize for that typo will find in jesus the fulfillment of their ancient messianic hopes but their nation as a whole the people as the distinct body that they now are in all nations the jews as a unit shall not at that time accept the word of truth but a beginning will be made, a fountain will be laid, a foundation will be laid, and then Christ will come and usher in the millennial year of his redeemed. 
we will not see Jerusalem and the Judah being returned until probably during the millennium will the great majority come back into the fold once Christ has split the Mount of Olives in two and they realize that the Christ that they crucified was the true Messiah. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained that the current gathering of the Jews to their homeland is not a fulfillment of this prophecy, but a political gathering. Quote, As all the world knows, many Jews are now gathering to Palestine, where they have their own nation and way of worship, all without reference to a belief in Christ, or an acceptance of the laws and ordinances of his everlasting gospel. Is this the latter-day gathering of the Jews of which the scriptures speak? No, it is not. Let there be no misunderstanding in any discerning mind on this point. This gathering of the Jews to their homeland and their, re and their organization to a nation and a kingdom is not the gathering promised by the prophets. It does not fulfill the ancient promises. Those who have thus assembled have not gathered into the true church and fold of their ancient Messiah. The gathering right now, as he said, is political. The Jews have yet to become Israel. The only way you become Israel is through the waters of baptism. That's how you gain the covenant name of Israel, is through baptism. And that is not happening yet in Jerusalem. President Marion G. Romney, the first presidency, spoke of the gathering of Judah. He read selections from the Book of Mormon that teach what the Jews must do before the Father will gather them to the land of their inheritance. From these selections, we learn that when the Jews no more turn aside their hearts against the Holy One of Israel, when they come to the knowledge of their Redeemer, when they shall be restored to the true church and fold of God, when they believe in me that I am Christ, when they believe that Christ is the Son of God and believe in the Atonement and worship the Father in his name with pure hearts and clean hands and look not forward any more for another Messiah, when the fullness of my gospel shall be preached unto them, and they shall pray unto the Father in the Savior's name, then they will be gathered to Jerusalem, the land of their inheritance. These predictions by the Book of Mormon prophets make it perfectly clear that the restoration of the house of Israel to the lands of their inheritance will signal their acceptance of Jesus Christ as their Redeemer, to which I testify in the name of Jesus Christ. End of quote. Chapter 20, verse 35, the Father hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. What is the meaning of the phrase, the Father hath made bare his holy arm? In ancient times, when men prepared for battle by throwing their cloak away from their shoulders of their fighting arm, at the second coming of Christ, God will make bare his arm when he shows forth his power for all to see. That is, the Lord has come to earth again. He has demonstrated his power, has cleansed the earth of sin. He has brought to pass that which no mortal institution could have produced, the gathering of the children of Jacob. Chapter 20, verse 36 through 37. Put on thy strength and loose thyself from thy bands of thy neck. Doctrine Covenants 113 explains the phrase, put on the strength, means that Latter-day priesthood holders will put on the authority of the priesthood, which they have a right to by lineage. The bands of thy neck are the curses of God upon her, or the remnants of Israel in their scattered condition among the Gentiles. So being loosed from the bands, the neck is being loosed from the curse of being scattered and gathered in again. Speaking of the eventual, eventual movement towards the millennial era, Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained the Savior's words, quote, We have already seen that Jesus put chapter 52 of Isaiah in a millennial context. In it is found the cry, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem. The holy city, for henceforth there shall be no more come unto thee, the uncircumcised and the unclean. In the day of which we speak, there will be none who are unclean in the celestial sense of the word, for the wicked will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. And there will be none who are uncircumcised, as it were, for all who seek the blessings of the holy city will be in harmony with the plans and purposes of him whose city it is. End of quote. Chapter 20, verse 39, in that day, meaning the day of the Savior's coming, the millennial reign of the Savior. Chapter 20, verse 40, how beautiful upon the mountains. 
Elder Jeffrey R. Holland in the Quorum of the Twelve False Apostles taught that this wonderful descriptive phrase, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings unto them that publish peace, refers to those who spread the Lord's gospel, but that is more specifically, but that it more specifically refers to the Savior himself. Quote, these familiar passages written first by Isaiah, then spoken of and inspired by Jehovah himself, are often applied to anyone, especially missionaries, who bring the good tidings of the gospel and publish peace to the souls of men. There is nothing inappropriate about such an application, but it is important to realize, as the prophet Abinadi did, that in its purest form and original sense, since this psalm of application applies specifically to Christ, it is he and only he who ultimately brings the good tidings of salvation. Only through him in true lasting peace published is true lasting peace published. To Zion in both the Old and New Jerusalem, it is Christ who declares that God reigneth. It is his feet upon the mountain of redemption that are beautiful. End of quote. Chapter 20, verse 40, the phrase, Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland taught what it meant for priest holders to be clean. Quote, As priesthood bearers, not only are we to handle sacred vessels and emblems of God's power, think of preparing, blessing, and passing the sacrament, for example, but we are also to be a sanctified instrument, partly because of what we are to do, but more importantly because of what we are to be, the prophets and the apostles tell us to flee useful lusts and call on the Lord out of a pure heart. They tell us to be clean. End of quote. The injunction, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord, given to those in ancient times who handled sacred vessels of the worship, applies to modern priesthood holders as well. President Gordon B. Hinckley reminded a gathering of, priest, of the priesthood of this important command when he said, Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Thus has he spoken to us in modern revelation. Be clean in body. Be clean in mind. Be clean in language. Be clean in dress and manner. End of quote. President Hinckley further canceled, A tattoo is graffiti on the temple of the body. Likewise, the piercing of the body. End of quote. Elder Russell M. Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles counseled young men and women to avoid evil talk, to choose your friends wisely, to stay away from pornography and illicit drugs, to not attend evil concerts and dangerous parties, to respect your bodies and keep yourselves morally clean in every way. End of quote. Chapter 20, verse 42, For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel shall be your rearward. In the Hebrew text of this verse from Isaiah 52, 12, the word for Lord is Jehovah, and the word for God is Elohim. Thus the faithful are promised that Jehovah will go before them, and in the rearward will be Elohim to protect them. What a great promise we have, brothers and sisters. Jehovah to guide us. And Elohim to provide the rear guard to protect us. Isaiah, uh, chapter 20, which is Isaiah 52, 13 through 15. My servant shall deal prudently. I apologize, I didn't put what chapter this is in, Isaiah, in chapter 20. Is a dualistic prophecy. On the one hand, it refers to Christ. These verses belong with Isaiah 53 as introductory material for the greatest of the Old Testament messianic chapters. The Savior's visage was so marred more than any man when he suffered for the sins of mankind and was crucified on Calvary. Nails, metal, metal, metal spikes were driven into his hands and feet, and a spear pierced his side to ensure his death. On the other hand, the Savior himself made it clear that Isaiah 52.13 also has reference to a servant involved in the great and marvelous work of the Father in the last days. The Book of Mormon verse undoubtedly refers to Joseph Smith and the Restoration. Men marred him, persecuted him throughout his life until they succeeded in killing him. Yet power was given him by the Father to bring forth unto the Gentiles the Book of Mormon as well as other Latter-day Revelations. As a result, kings and rulers of the earth behold and consider things which had not been told them. Let's now go to 3 Nephi chapter 21. 
21 verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, and 11 says, These things, these works, and them. All of these phrases refer to the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is the key to the gathering of Israel in the latter days. Why I Can Trust the Savior, Prophecies of Latter Days and Their Fulfillment. Chapter 21, 1 through 3, Prophecy. Jesus gives a sign of when the house of Israel will be gathered after being scattered by the Gentiles. That sign is the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Historical fact, 600 B.C., Lehi leaves Jerusalem. Part of Israel goes to America. 587 B.C., house of Israel is scattered among the nations. 70 A.D., those left in Jerusalem scattered again among the nations, this time by the Romans. The Book of Mormon is brought about by the way of Gentiles to gather in from their long dispersion, the house of Israel. Chapter 21, verse 4, Prophecy. The gospel is set up in the land among a free people so that these things, the Book of Mormon, might come forth to fulfill the covenant of the Father to his people, the house of Israel. Historical facts, the Gentiles, Europeans, conquer and establish America as a free nation. Chapter 21, verses 5 through 9, Prophecy. The gospel is to be restored by the Gentiles to show forth God's power among them. And if they repent and be baptized, that should be they, may be numbered among the house of Israel. This restoration, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, is a sign that the Father has commenced unto the fulfilling of the covenant unto the house of Israel. In that day, kings or prominent men will be astonished. Though it will be marvelous, that should be though, and not thoughts not thought. Though it will be a marvelous work, and among them many will not believe it, though a man shall declare it. Joseph Smith. Historical facts. The gospel is restored in the Book of Mormon brought to pass by a man, Joseph Smith. A Gentile and prominent men shall consider these things which they have not seen nor heard. For example, Josiah Quincy, a man who became the mar mayor of Boston, visited Joseph Smith in Nauvoo. He later wrote, It is by no means improbable that some future textbook for the use of generations yet unborn will contain a question something like this. What historical American of the 19th century has exerted the most powerful influence upon the destinies of his countrymen, and it is by no means impossible that the answer to that interrogatory may be thus written, Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet. And the reply, absurd as it is doubtless seems to most men now living, may be an obvious commonplace to their descendants. It is reported that Count Leo Tolstoy, in speaking of Mormonism, said, Their principles teach the people not only of heaven and its attending glories, but how to live so that their social and economic relations with each other are placed on a sound basis. If the people follow the teachings of this church, nothing can stop their progress. It will be limitless. There have been great moments, movements started in the past, but they have died or been mo modified before they reach maturity. If Mormon is able to endure unmodified until it reaches the third and fourth generation, it is destined to become the greatest power the world has ever known. End of Tolstoy's quote. What a great insight by a non-member of the church. Certainly he was speaking by the power of the Holy Ghost. Chapter 21 verses 10 through 11, Prophecy. God's servant, Joseph Smith, will be marred, yet he would be in the God's hands. They shall not hurt him, though he be marred. Those who will not believe in God's word, the Book of Mormon, which was given by the power of God, will be cut off from among the covenant people. Historical fact, DNC 122, 349. Thy people shall never be turned against thee by the testimony of traitors, the voice of the Lord whispered to Joseph in Liberty Jail. And although their influence shall cast thee into trouble and into bars and walls, thou shalt be had in honor, and but for a small moment, and thy voice shall be more terrible in the midst of thine enemies than the fierce lion because of thy righteousness. And thy God shall stand by thee forever and ever. 
Therefore, hold on thy way, and thy priests shall remain with thee, for their bounds are set, they cannot pass. Thy days are known, and thy years shall be numbered less, shall not be numbered less. Therefore, fear not what man can do, for God shall be with you forever and ever. Though cruel and wicked men would murder the head of this final dispensation, yet the work which he would set in motion, the marvelous work and a wonder, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, would roll forward to eventually fill the whole earth. Thus, Joseph Smith is healed in the sense that the work is started, that the work he started would continue until it fills the whole earth. Chapter 20, verses 12 through 19, A Prophecy God's people, who are a remnant of Jacob, shall be among the Gentiles as a lion among the beasts, even as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he go through, will tread them down and tear them in pieces, and none can deliver. If the Gentiles do not repent, God will cut off their horses and chariots, meaning implements of war, and will cut off the cities of thy land and their strongholds, and cut out of the land witchcraft, susane, graven images, and pluck up their groves. That, were, that means places where they worship false idols. All lying, deceiving, envying, strifes, and priestcrafts and whoredoms shall be done away with. Historical facts. These verses are in a millennial context. All the destruction spoken of above will be accomplished when the Son of God comes again in great power and glory, thus being compared to a lion who goes through and destroys the flock. Chapter 21, verses 20 through 22, a prophecy. At that day, the day of Christ's coming, those who will not repent will be cut off from among his people, and vengeance will be executed upon them. But those who repent hearken to God's work and harden not their hearts. God will establish his church among them, and they shall come into the covenant and be numbered among the house of Jacob. Historical facts. In April of 1830, Joseph Smith establishes Christ's church with his ordinances and covenants. Chapter 21, verses 23 through 24, the prof a prophecy. Members of the church will assist the remnant of Jacob to come unto Christ and be gathered who are scattered to build the new Jerusalem. Historical facts. Joseph Smith sent out message, missionaries to the Gentiles, America, and to the Lamanites, the American Indians. Chapter 21, verses 26 through 29, the prophecy. The gospel will be preached among the remnants of God's people, even all the dispersed of his people, even the tribes that have been lost. Then shall the work commence among all nations to prepare the way for them to be gathered home, and they shall go out from among all nations. Historical fact. Joseph first sends missionaries to England. Orson Hyde sent to Jerusalem to dedicate the land for the return of the Jews, and eventually today missionaries sent throughout the world. Thus we see that from the foregoing that the Savior keeps his words and fulfills all his prophecies. Therefore, we can put our complete trust in him and his word. Chapter 21, verse 23. President Joseph Fielding Smith explained, I think this, 3 Nephi 21, 23, is the stumbling block. This has been interpreted to mean that the remnant of Jacob are those of the descendants of Lehi, but there is nothing in the passage as I read it which would convey this thought. Remember that all through the, all through the Lord has been speaking of the remnant of Jacob or Israel and of the great promises made to the Gentiles who are on this land and in other lands if they will only come into the church and be numbered with the house of Israel. Their privileges would be to assist in building the new Jerusalem, and if they refuse, then shall the punishments come upon them. I take it, I take it we, the members of the church, most of us of the tribe of Ephraim, are of the remnant of Jacob. We know it to be the fact that the Lord called upon the descendants of Ephraim to commence his work in the earth in the last days. We know further that it has that he said that he set Ephraim according to the promise of his birthright at the head. Ephraim receives the bless, the richer blessings. These blessings mean those of presidency or direction. The keys are with Ephraim. It is Ephraim who is to be endowed with power to bless and give the other tribes, including the Lamanites, their blessings. 
all the other tribes of Jacob, including the Lamanites, are to be crowned with glory in Zion by the hands of Ephraim. Now, did the scriptures teach that Ephraim, after doing all this, is to abdicate or relinquish his place and give it to Lamanites and then receive orders from this branch of the house of Jacob in building the new Jerusalem? This certainly is inconsistent with the whole plan and with all that the Lord has revealed in the Doctrine and Covenants in relation to the establishment of Zion and the building of the new Jerusalem. That the remnants of Joseph found among the descendants of Lehi will have part in this great work is certainly consistent. And the great work of this restoration, the building of the temple in the city of Zion or New Jerusalem, will fall to the lot of the descendants of Joseph. But it is Ephraim who will stand at the head and direct the work. So the tribe of Ephraim has the keys of directing this church. Chapter 21, verse 26. And then shall the work of the Father commence at that day. This is a millennial setting. It is a setting in which wickedness and crime and vengeance are no longer on the earth. It is an era when goodness and decency and integrity are the order of the day. In this setting, in this day, the work of the Father, the work of the gathering of Israel, shall commence. Commence? Has not the work of gathering, the manner in which individuals are baptized, confirmed, ordained, endowed, and sealed, been in full operation since the days of Joseph Smith? Yes, the work of the Father shall commence in the great millennial day, in the sense that its magnitude shall be infinitely greater than anything we can even identify with today. All that has gone on in the past will seem to pale in significance when missionaries' go, work goes forward during the thousand years. Like I said before, we have not seen anything yet when it comes to the gathering of Israel. Jehovah spake through Jeremiah, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, The Lord liveth that brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth that brought the, up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither he hath delivered them. And I will bring them again into their land, and I will give unto their fathers. And then the master described the manner in which missionaries will search out the people. Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And after will I send many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain, from every hill, and out of the holes of the rocks. So Jeremiah prophesies that the gathering during the millennium of Israel will be so overwhelming, so grand in nature, that it will overshadow the gathering of Israel out of the land of Egypt and the parting of the Red Sea. We will no longer look at that as the great gathering and miracle, but we will see the gathering in the millennium as the grand, great gathering. Chapter 21, verse 26, At that day shall the work of the Father commence among the tribes which have been lost. We have seen earlier through a modern revelation that the setting for the great work of the gathering, particularly the ten lost tribes, is millennial. Elder Bruce R. McConkie has written, We do not say that occasional blood descendants of Reuben or Naphtali or others of the tribes of Hedge shall not return to their Palestine Zion or assemble in America Zion or find their way into the stakes of Zion in all nations, all before the second coming of Christ. Some shall no doubt return to Canaan as true believers and members of the true church with the intent and purpose of fulfilling the scriptures and building up the ancient cities of Israel. This may well happen in some small measure, and to it there can be no objection. Great movements have small beginnings, and floods that sweep forth from bursting dams are first forecasted when small rivulets trickle from the pent-up reservoirs. But we do say that the great day of the return of the ten tribes, the day when the assembling host shall fulfill the prophetic promises, shall come after our Lord's return. End of Elder McConkie's quote. Let's now go to 3 Nephi 22, which is Isaiah 54. 22, 1 through 8. The bride of the Lord is prepared. Once again, the figure of a marriage is employed. Israel is called a barren wife because of her inability or unwillingness to produce spiritual offspring for the Lord. But in the end, when she is gathered once again, there will be more children from the desolate or temporarily forsaken wife than when she enjoyed her wedded status in ancient times. This being true, 
Space must be found so that the Latter-day Tent of Zion can be expanded to accommodate them all. When one wishes to make a small tent larger, one must pull up the stakes and move to a further distance from the center pole. That is what is meant by lengthening the cords and strengthening thy stakes. Israel's latter-day growth through conversion and gathering is represented as breaking forth on the right hand and on the left. In ancient times, the inability to bear children was considered a great curse by women of the Middle East. As a gathered wife, Israel will forget the shame or cast off status of her early years and rejoice in her new and prosperous condition. She is once again married to the Lord. The barren or forsaken years, though they seemed long, were but a small moment compared to the vast eternity that lies ahead. Chapter 22, verse 2. Strengthen thy stakes. Doctrine and Covenants 115, 1 through 8. Verily thus saith the Lord unto my servant Joseph, and also my servant Sidney Rignan, and also my servant Hiram Smith, and your counselors who are and shall be appointed hereafter, and also unto you my servant Edward Partridge and his counselors, and also unto my faithful servants who are of the high council of my church in Zion. For thus it shall be called, and unto all the elders and people of my church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, scattered abroad in all the world. For thus shall my church be called in the latter days, even the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Verily I say unto you all, Arise and shine forth, that thy light may be a standard for the nations, and that the gathering together of the land of Zion and upon her stakes may be for a defense and for a refuge from the storm and from wrath when it shall be poured out without mixture upon the whole earth. Let the city far west be a holy and consecrated land to me, and it shall be called most holy, for the ground upon which thou standest is holy. Therefore I command you to build a house unto me, for the gathering together of my saints, that they may worship me. 22 verses 9 through 17. What is meant by the waters of Noah? Verse 1. Scattered Israel, those who for, who for generations have lived without the light of the gospel, who have, who have been fruitful in the... Let me try it again. Scattered Israel, those who for generations have lived without the light of the gospel, who have not been faithful in the fruit of their in the faith of their fathers, these are also identified in this passage as the children of the desolate. Verses two through three. The command here is to spread out, to make room for those who are to be gathered home. For Zion must increase in beauty and in holiness. Her borders must be enlarged. Her stakes must be gathered. Yea, and I say unto you, Zion must rise and put on her beautiful garments. Verse 4, scattered Israel's, unf scattered Israel's unfaithfulness, her failure to forsake the ways of Babylon and receive the covenants of Zion, shall be forgiven. Israel's God will remember her and the promises he made to her. The reproach of her youth, her spiritual sterility, shall be forgotten. Verses 5 through 6, the bridegroom of the Lord of hosts shall return to receive his bride, repentant Israel. The wanderings of Israel over the generations, her tendencies towards unfaithfulness, her inclination to go whoring after other gods will be a thing of the past. Verses 7 through 8, Jehovah explained, Zion hath said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. But he will show that he hath not. For can a woman forget her second child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee, O house of Israel. Behold, I have engraven thee upon the palms of my hands. Verse 9, when God makes promises, he keeps them. He vowed to send a flood to cleanse the earth in Noah's day, and then covenant with Noah that he would never again destroy the earth in that manner. Verse 10, his promises to restore Israel in the latter days is as the waters of Noah unto me. That is, his promise to restore Israel is just as sure as his promise to Noah. Mountains may depart and hills be removed, but God's promise will still see fulfillment. In her gathered condition, Zion will be beautiful. The precious gems mentioned in verses 11 and 12 represent the material and spiritual blessings that redeemed Israel will enjoy, including the children being taught of the Lord. 
Verse 13, and knowing great peace. Verse 14 through 17, Israel's pains, her travails, her persecution by enemies shall come to an end. Those who oppose the chosen people shall be destroyed at the time of the second coming. And the prosperity of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the flock of the Lord Jehovah, shall be protected and guided by their eternal shepherd. There have always been those who have fought against the work of the Lord. As Isaiah promised, they have not prospered in their efforts against us. President Gordon B. Hinckley taught that their works would come to naught. Quote, as surely as this is the work of the Lord, there will be opposition. There will be those, perhaps not a few, who wish the who with the sophistry of beguiling words and clever design will spread doubt and seek to undermine the foundation on which this cause is established. They will have their brief day in the sun. They may have for a brief season the plaudits of the doubters and the skeptics and the critics, but they will fade and be forgotten as have their kind in the past. Meanwhile, we shall go forward regardless of their criticism, aware of but undeterred by their statements and actions. End of quote. Doctrine and Covenants 71, 9 through 11, a revelation given to Joseph Smith and Seven New Regnant. Verily, thus saith the Lord unto you, there is no weapon that is formed against you that shall prosper. And if any man lift his voice against you, he shall be commanded in his own due time. Verse 11, Wherefore, keep my commandments, they are true and faithful. Even so, amen. Nothing will stop this work that the great Jehovah has commenced in the latter days. 23 verse 13, the phrase, Thy children shall be taught of the Lord. While serving as the general president of the primary, Sister Patricia B. Pinnegar explained how 3 Nephi 12 13 is used in our day to guide us in teaching our children. Quote, the world is not a safe place. It is not a place where children will feel hope, peace, and direction unless they are taught to love and follow the Savior. Please help them know that these great blessings can be theirs and show them what they need to do to receive these blessings. End of quote. Let's turn now to 3 Nephi chapter 23. 23 verse 1, the phrase, ye ought to search these things. The Savior has just quoted Isaiah 54, so he is commanding us to search the writings of Isaiah. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote, If our eternal salvation depend upon our ability to understand the writings of Isaiah as fully and truly as Nephi understood them, and who shall say that this is not the case? How shall we fare in that great day when, with Nephi, we will stand before the pleasing bar of him who said, Great are the words of Isaiah. It just may be that my salvation and yours also does in fact depend on our ability to understand the writing of Isaiah as fully and truly as Nephi understood them. For that matter, why should either Nephi or Isaiah know anything that is withheld from us? Does not the God who is no respecter of persons treat all his children alike? Has he not given us his promise and recited to us the terms and conditions of his law pursuant to which he will reveal to us? what he has revealed to them, end of quote. The Lord commands his saints to search the scriptures rather than merely read them. When people search the scriptures, they carefully examine them in an effort to discover something, or they explore thoroughly by serious inquiry and inspection. Searching the scriptures also in the case that we meditate, study, heed, and ponder. In addition to the scriptures, the Savior commanded us to search the words of the prophets. The prophet Joseph Smith encouraged the saints to search the scriptures in order to receive an independent witness of the truth and to obtain direction, direct instruction from the Lord. Quote, search the scriptures, search the revelations which we publish, and ask your fa heavenly Father in the name of his Son Jesus Christ to manifest the truth unto you, and if you do it with an eye single to his glory, nothing doubting, he will answer you by the power of his Holy Spirit. You will then know for yourselves and not for another. You will not then be dependent on man for the knowledge of God, nor will there be any room for speculation. No, for when men receive their instruction from him that made them, they know how he will save them. Then again we say, search the scriptures, search the prophets, and learn what portion of them belongs to you. End of Joseph Smith's quote. 
although the searching of the scriptures may be difficult at first. President Gord B. Hinckley promised that those who seriously study the scriptures will be enlightened and their spirits lifted. Quote, I am grateful for the emphasis on the reading of the scriptures. I hope that you, for you this will be something far more enjoyable than a duty, that rather it will become a love affair with the word of God. I promise you that as you read, your minds will be enlightened and your spirits will be lifted. At first it may seem tedious, but that will change into a wonderful experience with thoughts and words of things divine. End of quote. President Henry B. Iron of the First Presidency said, If we rush too quickly while reading the scriptures, we are not allowing the Holy Ghost to tutor us. The Holy Ghost will guide what we say if we study and ponder the scriptures every day. The words of the scriptures invite the Holy Spirit. With daily study of the scriptures, we can count on this blessing. We treasure the word of God not only by reading the words of the scriptures, but by studying them. We may be nourished more by pondering a few words, allowing the Holy Ghost to make them treasures to us, than by passing quickly and superficially over whole chapters of scripture. End of quote. 23 verse 1, great are the words of Isaiah. It is one thing for the prophets or the saints to quote the Lord, such as appropriate and necessary. It is quite another for the Lord to quote someone and then to command the saints to search that prophet's writings. What greater recommendation could there be for us to begin a lifelong study, search and study of Isaiah? The Savior taught that the breadth of Isaiah's prophecies covered all things concerning my people a remarkable magnitude of God's dealings. The Savior endorsed Isaiah's prophecies by declaring, Great are the words of Isaiah. Chapter 22 of 3 Nephi is the last of over 20 Isaiah chapters quoted in the Book of Mormon. Notice that the Savior particularly directed his listeners to search the writings of the prophet Isaiah. It is not surprising that Isaiah is quoted heavily in the Book of Mormon and in other scripture. President Boyd K. Packer, President of Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, emphasized the unique, important role of the prophecies of Isaiah and why the Lord preserved his words. Quote, Isaiah is the most quoted prophet in the New Testament. The Lord himself quoted Isaiah seven times and the apostles 40 times more. In addition, there are nine partial quotes or paraphrases of Isaiah's words. Chapter 22, verse 2, it must needs be that he must speak also to the Gentiles. An angel explained to Nephi that the Bible is a record which is likened to the engravings which are upon the plates of brass, save there are not so many. Nevertheless, they contain the covenants of the Lord, which he hath made unto the house of Israel. Wherefore, they are of great worth unto the Gentiles. This can be viewed from at least a couple of perspectives. If we speak of Gentiles as pure Gentiles, meaning those who are not descendants from the twelve tribes of Israel, then the prophetic oracles of Isaiah are of worth to the Gentiles, because many of the Gentiles will receive the gospel, be adopted into the house of Israel, and thereafter enjoy fellowship with the saints. Their destiny is thus the same as those who had been born into Israel or who had been members of the church previously. If we speak of the Gentiles, those who are of Israel, either members of the church or non-members, who, who live outside, I'm sorry, that should be live. who live outside the land of Israel, that is, those who are Israelite by descendant, by descent, but Gentiles by culture, then again the destiny of the Gentiles is inextricably tied to that of Israel. The gospel comes first to Gentiles in the last days, and from them it goes to the Lamanites and the Jews. Thus members of the church read the Holy Scriptures, particularly the writings of Isaiah, find meaning and direction and come to identify clearly with his prophetic pronouncements regarding the house of Israel. In short, Isaiah's words, though directed primarily to Israel, are of everlasting worth to all people, Jew and Gentile alike. Chapter 23, verse 3, all things that he spake have been and shall be. Here the Savior essentially says to the Nephites, you can trust Isaiah. Many of the things of which he prophesied have already taken place. Many more shall yet come to pass. His word is true and faithful. Jesus may also have intended to convey the idea that Isaiah's words have dual or multiple fulfillment. Thus the past becomes the key that unlocks the future. As history has its cycles, so prophetic 
prophecies have multiple fulfillments and repeated applications. Isaiah's prophecies of events now past foretell events yet future. The past is the stage upon which the future is portrayed. The scriptures thus have a timeless value and an eternal relevance. Chapter 22, verse 6 through 13, Importance of an Accurate Scriptural Record The accuracy and completeness of the scriptural record is vital since we rely on it to gain our understanding of God and His plan for us. Verses 6 through 13 and 3 Nephi 23 include the fulfillment of Samuel's prophecies about the resurrection that had previously been missing and that the Savior asked to be included in the record. Isaiah is the most quoted prophet in the Doctrine and Covenants. 66 quotations from 31 chapters of Isaiah attest to the singular importance of this great prophet. All of this confirms that the Lord has a purpose in preserving Isaiah's words. 23 verse 14, when Jesus expounded all the scriptures in one. In one sense, to say that Jesus expounded all scriptures in one may mean that our Lord taught the people the entire plan of salvation out of the scriptures, perhaps even opening the heavens and providing the visions necessary to understand what had been, what was, and what was to come. Such a panoramic vision might not be unlike what was for about safe to Enoch, the brother of Jared or Joseph Smith. Of his own experience and vision, Joseph Smith said nothing could be more pleasing to the saints upon the order of the kingdom of the Lord than the light which burst upon the world through the vision, meaning section 76. Every law, every commandment, every promise, every truth, and every point touching the destiny of man, from Genesis to Revelation, where the purity of the scriptures remains unsullied by the fall of men, go to show that perfection of the theory of the different degrees of glory in the future life and witness the fact that the document is a transcript from the records of the eternal world. On a later occasion, the prophet explained, I could explain a hundredfold more than I ever have of the glories of the kingdoms manifested to me in the vision where I permitted and were the people prepared to receive them. Expounding all the scriptures in one, which truly only the master, the author of scripture could do, would also demonstrate clearly and unquestionably that all things bear witness of Christ, things in heaven and on earth, things past, things present, and things to come. Such an experience would would ver verily the test would verify that's not verily. That would verify the testimony of the prophets that none of the prophets have written or prophesied save they have spoken concerning this Christ. All things before Christ point forward to his day and to the essentiality of his majestic ministry. All things since his mortal experience point back to his entrance into the world as the meridian or central point in time as well as towards that future day when he shall come with ten thousand times ten thousands of his angels to reign of king of kings and lord of lords. As the risen Lord walked on the road to Emmaus with two disciples, they failed to discern who it was that had joined them. He asked about their conversation. They then then spoke concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things are done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre, when they found not his body, they come saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre, and found it even so as the woman had said. But him they saw not. Then Jesus said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things, and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Let's turn to chapter 24 of 3 Nephi, which is Malachi 3. Chapter 24, verse 1, the coming of the messenger to prepare the way of the Lord. 
One of the messengers sent to pray the word of the Lord at his first coming was John the Baptist. John's mission was performed in the spirit and power of the priesthood of Elias. Elias is a name for a forerunner, one who goes before or prepares the way for someone or something greater. In that sense, the Aaronic priesthood is the priesthood of Elias because it prepares and qualifies individuals for greater blessings. Joseph Smith explained, quote, The spirit of Elias is to prepare the way for a greater revelation of God, which is the priesthood of Elias, or the priesthood that Aaron was ordained unto. And when God sends a man into the world to prepare for a greater work, holding the keys and the power of Elias, it was called the doctrine of Elias, even from the early ages of the world. End of Joseph Smith's quote. Joseph Smith was also an Elias in that he was a forerunner, one who prepared the way, who laid the foundation for the second coming through the restoration of the gospel. In the meridian of time, the way was prepared by John for the messenger of the covenant himself to come and bring the greater blessings. He who was mightier than John and followed after him to and followed after him to baptize with fire and the Holy Ghost was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is called the messenger of the covenant because he mediates the gospel of salvation unto men. Elder Bruce R. McConkey explained, Our Lord is the messenger of the covenant. He came in, in his Father's name, bearing his Father's message to fulfill the covenant of the Father, that a Redeemer and Savior would be provided for men. Also, through his ministry, the terms of the everlasting covenant of salvation became operative. The message he taught was that salvation comes through the gospel covenant. When he comes to earth a second time, he will make more than one appearance before he comes in the clouds of heaven for all flesh to see him together. At least one of those appearances include a sudden visit to his temple yet to be built in Jackson County, Missouri. Elder McConkie stated, Malachi recorded the promise speaking of latter-day events that the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Certainly the Almighty is not limited in the number of appearances and returns to the earth needed to fulfill the scriptures, usher in the final dispensation, and consummate his greater latter-day work. This sudden latter-day appearance in the temple does not have reference to his appearance at the great and dreadful day for that coming will be when he sets his foot upon the Mount of Olives in the midst of the great for the final great war. The temple appearance was fulfilled in part at least by his return to the Kirtland Temple on April 3, 1836, and it may well be that he will come again suddenly to other of his temples, more particularly that which will be erected in Jackson County, Missouri. In this connection, it is worthy of note that whenever and wherever the Lord appears, he will come suddenly. That is quickly in an hour, ye think not. His oft-repeated warning, Behold, I come quickly, means that when he comes, that when the appointed hour arrives, he will come with a speed and suddenness which will leave no further time for preparation for that great day. Chapter 24, verses 2 and 5. Who may abide the coming, the day of Christ's coming? The Lord's return to earth and glory will be a great and dreadful day. As John the Baptist told the Jews, the Savior will be gathered, will gather in the wheat, the righteous, and the chaff, the wicked. He will burn with unquenchable fire. The only ones who survive will be those who have kept their covenants with the Lord, or who are worthy of at least a paradisiacal or terrestrial glory. All wickedness will be destroyed from the earth. 1. Habakkuk 2, 1 through 4 says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tablets that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for a point of time, but at the end it shall speak and, it, and lie not. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. So that verse in Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith, that is those who will be worthy at Christ's second coming. Faith is doing what God wants, when God wants it done, and how God wants it done, regardless of the outcome. 
Number two, Zephaniah 2, 1 through 3 says, Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nations not desired, before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgments. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. So Zephaniah tells us to gather and seek the Lord. Elder Alvin A. Dyer gave the following definition of meekness. I believe there's perhaps a distinction between humility and meekness. It may be said that meekness is a condition of voluntary humility. One is not compelled to be humble, but one voluntarily chooses to be humble is meekness. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, When Christ comes the second time, it will be in the clouds of heaven, and it shall be the day of vengeance against the ungodly, when those who have loved wickedness and have been guilty of transgression and rebellion against the law of God will be destroyed. All during the ministry of Christ, wickedness ruled and seemed to prevail, but when he comes in the clouds of glory, as it is declared in this message of Malachi to the world, and which, has, and which was said by Moroni to be near at hand, when Christ will appear as the refiner and purifier of both man and beast, and all that pertains to the earth, for the earth itself shall undergo a change and receive its former paradisiacal glory. Chapter 24, verse 5, Don't do this, and I will come near unto you to judgment, and I will be a swift mess witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, and against false swearers, and against those that oppress, and hirelings in his wages, the widows, the fatherless, that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widows, and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear me not, saith the Lord. In other words, those who do the opposite of all those wicked things will be prepared for his coming. Chapter 24, verse 3 through 4, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. When Christ was to come in his glory and rule for a thousand years, his saints, but before that event, there should be great judgments in the earth, and more especially at his appearance. Consequently, he would be, as the scriptures say, like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Here a good opportunity to impress the importance of having the righteous people of the earth duly warned and prepared for the judgments to come. Sidney B. Sperry says, Now the question arises as to whom Malachi was referring when he mentions the sons of Levi, who were to be purged as gold and silver, that they might offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Moroni undoubtedly expounded it all to the young prophet, and we are fortunate in finding the answer to our query in the Doctrine and Covenants. Once, when in an exalted mood, the prophet Joseph Smith wrote as follows in D.N.C. 128, 24. Behold, the great day of the Lord is at hand, and who can abide the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Let us therefore as a church, and as a people, and as Latter-day Saints, offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness, and let us present it in his holy temples when it is finished, a book containing the records of our dead, which shall be worthy of all acceptation. The answer is clear and unmistakable, because the passage of Malachi which we have been considering is given along with it. The Latter-day Saints, as a church and as a people, are the ones who are to offer up an offering in righteousness in the temple in the form of a book containing the records of our dead. We are now performing functions that will be required of the sons of Levi when they come into the church. In a figurative sense, we may be called the sons of Levi. That this conclusion is correct is made more certain by other references in the Doctrine and Covenants. In Doctrine and Covenants 84, 31 through 34, the Lord says, Therefore, as I said concerning the sons of Moses, for the sons of Moses and also the sons of Aaron shall offer an acceptable offering and sacrifices in the house of the Lord, which house shall be built unto the Lord in this generation, upon the consecrated spot I have appointed. And the sons of Moses and Aaron shall be filled with glory of the Lord 
upon Mount Zion in the Lord's house, whose sons are ye. For whosoever is faithful in attaining these two priests of which I have spoken, and magnifying their calling, are sanctified the spirit unto the renewing of their bodies. They become the sons of Moses and Aaron and the seed of Abraham and the church and kingdom and the elect of God. Part of verse 31 seems to be an allusion to Malachi 3.1 in that it refers to an acceptable offering. That is, an offering in righteousness. A point of doctrine not generally noticed in the church is that those who hold the priesthood are called the sons of Moses and Aaron. That is to say, they are to all intents sons of Levi, since both Moses and Aaron were literal descendants of Levi. In a sermon on priesthood, the prophet Joseph Smith also pointed out that the ordinance of sacrifice as it existed before the days of Moses will be performed by the sons of Levi as a part of the acceptable offering. Those who presently hold the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods are indeed the sons of Levi in a certain sense and are among the ones whom Malachi apparently had in mind when he gave this great prophecy. We have no wish to exclude any of the literal descent of Levi who may come later come into the church and perform temple work. It is possible, then, that Moroni began his explanation of temple work and of salvation for the dead in connection with the third chapter of Malachi rather than with the fourth chapter as so many persons in the church commonly suppose. There is more than one meaning for the offering and righteousness to be made by the sons of Levi or at or near the second coming of the Lord. With regard to animal sacrifice, Joseph Smith said it is generally supposed that sacrifice was entirely done away with when the great sacrifice, that is the sacrifice of the Lord, was offered up, that there will be no necessity for the ordinance of sacrifice in the future. But those who assert this are certainly not acquainted with the duties, privileges, and authority of the priesthood or with the prophets. The offering of the sacrifice has ever been connected and forms a part of the duties of the priesthood. It began with the priesthood and will be continued until after the coming of Christ from generation to generation. We frequently have mentioned made of the offering of sacrifice by the servants of the Most High in ancient days prior to the law of Moses, which ordinances will be continued when the priesthood is restored with all its authority, powers, and blessings. These sacrifices, as well as every ordinance belonging to the priest, will, when the temple of the Lord shall be built, the sons of Levi be purified, be fully restored, and attended to in all powers, ramifications, and blessings. This ever did and ever will exist when the powers of the Melchizedek priesthood are sufficiently manifest, else how can the restitution of all things spoken by the holy prophets be brought to pass? It is not to be understood that the law of Moses will be established again with all its rights and verities of ceremony, variety of ceremonies. This has never been spoken of by the prophets. But those things which existed prior to Moses' day, namely sacrifice, will be continued. So Joseph Smith prophesies that a part of the restoration of all things is that animal sacrifice that Adam did and Noah and all those before the law of Moses, that animal sacrifice will be restored again in the latter days. That has yet to happen as far as I know. 25, 34 verse 5, the Lord and his judgment will be swift witness against the sorcerers, which means to whisper a spell that is, to enchant or practice magic, who become numerous among the people after the Babylonian captivity, against the adulterers who were all too prevalent because of the influence of foreign people, against the false swearers or perjurers or those who hold back the pay of poor men and defraud or oppress the widow and the orphan, and finally against those who thrust aside the foreigner, stranger, or guest and fell in other ways to fear God. These indictments through Malachi show how alert and aware the prophets must have been of social injustices among his people. Malachi knew, as did Amos, that men cannot worship God acceptably and be unjust to their fellows. To find God, a man must also find his neighbor. Chapter 24, verses 3 and 6. I am the Lord, I change not. The meaning seems to be, I have not changed, but you have not kept your part of the covenant. You have not performed my words. Chapter 24, verse 7, you are gone away. 
from mine ordinances. One of the signs of apostasy is turning away from God by turning away from his ordinances. And the arm of the Lord shall be revealed. And the day cometh, they will not hear the voice of the Lord, neither the voice of his servants, neither give heed to the words of the prophets and apostles, shall be cut off from among the people. For they have strayed from mine ordinances and have broken mine everlasting covenant. Doctrine and Covenants 1, 14 through 15. Malachi exhorts the people to return unto me, and I will return unto you. The Hebrew word for return in this verse is shuv, meaning to literally, physically turn around. Israel had their backs to the Savior and heading in the opposite direction of the Savior. To begin their repentance process, they needed to physically turn and face the Savior in their thoughts, words, and actions. Chapter 24, verses 8 through 9. Wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? One of the ordinances of Israel had turned away from was tithing. In ancient Israel, tithes were paid to the Lord for his servants, the Levites, who had been given no inheritance. They in turn were tithed, and the proceeds were given to the priests. The offerings were of several varieties, such as, as bread, cakes, the annual half shekel, the tabernacle offering, offerings for the second temple when first erected. And little Grand Richard said, in addition to giving ourselves and giving our service, Lord has asked us to give of our means and our substance. We have men in the church who give their time and they go where they are asked to preach. They will perform a public duty, but it is hard for, hard to do little duty than is seen in secret by them and God alone and their presiding officers. And so we are asked to contribute our tithes and offerings, not only because the church needs money to build itself, for before there was an organization of the church, God introduced the principle of sacrifice in order that his servants and his children might be tested, that they should bring the best of their lands and of their herds. They were burned upon the altar of sacrifice, but the giving sanctified but the giving sanctified the souls of those who gave. And I want you and I want to say to you, my brothers and sisters, that we need the tithes of the saints in order that the kingdom might go on, for it shall be built up just as rapidly as the faith of the saints can build it, and it is retarded when it is a lack of when there is a lack of faith. Pain of tithes and offerings is tied to be to become pure in heart. In Hebrew, there is a difference between a thief and a robber as used in Malachi. A thief is someone who takes something that is not his. A robber as used in Malachi is one who tries to defraud by taking something that is not his through deceit. A clear translation of Malachi 3, 8 through 9 would then be, Will a man try to deceive God? Yet ye have tried to defraud me through deceit. But ye say, wherein have we tried to defraud thee through deceit, in tithes and offerings? Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have tried to take what is mine through deceit, even this whole nation. See, the Levites claiming to follow God, but they would not pay tithing. And trying to do so deceitfully, they would make oaths and covenants in the gospel, but they would not pay their tithes, hoping that God would not notice. Now look at Psalms 24, 3 through 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. And now the psalmist is going to define what clean hands and pure hearts are. Clean hands are those who have not lifted up his soul unto vanity. And a pure heart is those who nor sworn deceitfully. So a pure heart is those who make oaths and covenants with a, with a pure heart and do not swear deceitfully, meaning they make them with the intention of not keeping them. That is a pure heart. Since they were not keeping their oaths and were swearing deceitfully by not paying tithing, therefore the children of Israel at the time of Malachi were not pure in heart.
In other words, Israel, you have made sacred covenants with me, have sworn to obey and follow me, Jehovah. However, you have sworn deceitfully by trying to defraud me of what is mine through deception. Thus you have neither clean hands or a pure heart. Therefore, you cannot come to my temple, stand in my holy place, or return and live in my kingdom. In other words, Latter-day Saints, you, not, you cannot come to my church and make sacred covenants at the sacred altar of the sacrament table and then think you can try and defraud me through deceit by not paying tithing and, in the words of Alma, imagine to yourselves that you can lie unto the Lord in that day and say, Lord, our works have been righteous works upon the face of the earth and that he will save you. Brothers and sisters, making and keeping covenants and paying tithing is serious business. God will not be mocked. Yes, I am free to choose whether I pay tithing or not. However, I am not free to choose the consequences of those choices or how the consequences are given. In the word of Elder Maxwell, we had better want the consequences of what we want. So by keeping our covenants and swearing and making oaths and covenants in the temple and at the sacrament table with the intention of keeping them is what makes us of a clean and pure heart. Chapter 20, verses 10 through 12. Malachi then implies that because they rob God of these things, the blessings of the flesh have been withheld from them. The teachings that there is a relationship between man's service to God and the way in which the earth yields her fruit is most interesting. To Israel, ancient and modern, the Lord promised to open unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. In Hebrew, a more literal translation is, If I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour you out a blessing that will never cease, that is, it will last for eternity. That is the blessings of paying a faithful tithes and offerings. God will bless us eternally as a floodgate is open in heaven. We will never cease in being blessed. All material and spiritual things are his to give as he sees fit, including his blessings from heaven, are revelations from him in one's personal life. Including his blessings from heaven are revelations from him in one's personal life. All blessings are, of course, conditional. He desires to bless his faithful children abundantly. The devourer may mean locusts and other pests to agriculture, but it may refer to Satan as well. The Lord promised that the fruits of the ground and the vine will not come forth ahead of their time when they would be of little or no value. The implication is that our efforts to provide for ourselves would be blessed and bear fruit in their season. Because of the blessings that will come to the faithful, they will be recognized by the world around them, both individually and as a people. Brothers and sisters, we will have enough produce to take care of ourselves, enough fruit in its season. If you want to afflict climate change, then let's keep the Sabbath day holy. Let's pay our tithes and offerings. Weather conditions getting worse in the scriptures are directly linked to righteousness, not some man-made tripe and trifle that man has made up to control men here upon earth. We want to control the weather and have enough and to be productive in our fruits of our fields, then let's be righteous. 24, 13 through 15, it is vain to, is, it, is it vain to serve the Lord? One truth about covenant relationship is that both parties must observe their promises in order to keep the covenants in force. Sometimes when those lacking faith lose promised blessings, they blame the Lord. But the Lord is God. He never breaks a promise. The difficulty as described by Malachi is that the critics of the Lord have twisted the truth. They question the prophet stemming from observing the ordinance of the Lord and maintain that it is vain to serve God. Verse 14. Thus they they see in inequity when they, the wicked prosper and those who work evil are elevated and they blame the Lord for permitting such things to exist. Thus their words of criticism are stout against the Lord. Verse 13. 
Brother Spencer W. Kimmel said some time ago, a sister said to me, why is it, Brother Kimmel, that those who do the least in building of the kingdom seem to prosper most? We drive a Ford, our, brother, our neighbors drive a Cadillac. We observe the Sabbath day and attend our meetings. They play golf, hunt, fish, and play. We abstain from the forbidden while they eat, drink, and are merry and are unrestrained. We pay tithe in other church donations. They have their entire large incomes to lavish upon themselves. We are tired. We are tired home. We are tied home with our large families of small children, often ill. They are totally free for, of, for social life, to dine and dance. We wear cottons and ho woolens, and I wear a three-season coat, but they wear silk and off costly apparel. And we and she wears a mink coat. Our meager income is always strained and never seems adequate for necessities while the wealthy seem enough to allow them every luxury. And yet the Lord promised blessings to the faithful. It seems to me it does not pay to live the gospel that the proud and the covenant breakers are the ones who prosper. Then I said to her, yours is an ancient question. Job and Jeremiah made the same complaint. And I quoted for her the words through the Lord's answer through Malachi. Then I, then he read Malachi four one through two. Then I said to the disconsolate sister, "But for many rewards, you need not wait till the judgment day. You have many blessings today. You have your family of lovely, righteous children. What a rich reward for the so-called sacrifices! The blessings that you enjoy cannot be purchased with all your neighbor's wealth." End of President Kimball's quote. We are funny people. We think that success is in the worldly things of the world and the riches and luxuries. Brothers and sisters, having my family sealed to me is greater than all the luxuries and wealth of the world. I am indeed rich. I am rich with eternal life as I keep my covenants. 24 verse 16, what is the book of remembrance? Those who devote themselves to the Lord earn for themselves a privilege of having their names recorded in the Lamb's book of life. This sacred book of remembrance is kept in heaven and contains the names of the faithful children of Father in heaven, or in other words, those who are his precious jewels. They are those who will inherit eternal life, for this book contains the names of the sanctified, even them of the celestial world. Those whose names are written there and who afterwards return to sinful ways will have their names blotted from the book. Elder McCaukey explained Adam kept a written rec account of those faithful descendants in which his rec recorded their faith, faith and works, their righteousness and devotion, their revelations and vision, their adherence to the revealed plan of salvation, to signify the importance of honoring our worthy ancestors and of hearkening to the great truths revealed to them, Adam called his record a book of remembrance. It was prepared according to the pattern given by the finger of God. Similarly, records have been kept by the saints in all ages. Many of our present scriptures have come down to us because they were first written by prophets who were following Adam's pattern of keeping a book of remembrance. The church keeps similar records today and urges its member to keep their own personal and family books of remembrance. End of quote. Chapter 24, verse 17 through 18. In that day when I make up my jewels. Jewels is from the Hebrew root segula, meaning a personal possession or property that is treasured. Thus Malachi 3.17 could be translated as, And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day when I make up my personal possessions or my property, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. The great question is, brothers and sisters, are we willing to be God's personal property? Are we willing to be his personal possessions? Are we willing to be his servants and slaves? For if we are, then he will give us everything. Can we humble ourselves and become Christ's personal property? That will be up to each and one individual of us. Let's go to Third Nephi 25. 25, and this is Malachi chapter 4. 
chapter 25, 1 through 2, the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Wings in Hebrew is kanaf, meaning ex edge, extremity. So, for example, of a bird, its edge or extremity would be the end of its wing. The wing of a robe would be its edge or extremity, the hem. Numbers fifteen thirty seven through 40 commanded, the Lord commanded, and the Lord spake to Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations. And they put upon the fringe of borders a ribbon of blue, and it shall be unto you a fringe, that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. And that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which ye used to go a whoring. That you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. So ancient Israel were to put on the hem of their garments a blue thread to remind them to keep the commandments of the Lord daily. An example in Matthew 14, 34 through 36 is, And when they were gone over, they came unto the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out unto him all that country round about, and brought unto him all that were diseased, and besought him, that they might only touch the hem of his garment, and as many as touched were made perfectly whole. Is it, brothers and sisters, that the thing that they were touching at the hem of his garment was the blue thread? I consider that that is the possibility. That is why they knelt down and fell down and touched the hem of his garment. It wasn't just any place. It was probably the blue thread, which was a sign of their covenant to keep the commandments. And since they covenanted to keep his commandments, they were healed of their infirmities. Luke 8, 43-44 reads, And a woman, having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came from behind him, and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood was staunched. Is it possible that she was that she fell down and reached the hem of his garment because she was reaching for the blue thread? Yes, I believe that is so. And is it interesting that they are reaching for the wing of his garment? That they are reaching for the hem, the edge, the extremity where the blue thread was. And so he literally did come with healing in his wings. As people reached down and touched the wing, the hem of his garment, they were healed. Chapter 25, verse 2, you shall go and you should go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. The people of the Lord will be gathered to Christ and then to the lands of their inheritance during the great restoration of Israel in the millennium. Chapter 25, verse 4, Remember ye the law of Moses. Upon a cursory reading of this verse, one may wonder why Jesus is quoting this part of Malachi's prophecy in light of the fact that the law of Moses was fulfilled in Christ. The answer could possibly be that the Lord and Malachi were not referring to the Mosaic Code and carnal commandments, but rather to a different law that was given to Moses in Horeb, a higher law even the fullness of the gospel, that, because of Israel's rebellion and stiff-neckedness, they were never able fully receive. If this is the case, if this is in fact the case, this reference is particularly relevant to both the Nephites and the Latter-day Church. This seems to be the correct interpretation in light of the verse that follow and the essential role of Elijah and their having the fullness of gospel blessings. 25 verses 5 through 6, the coming of Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Prior to and at the coming of our Lord, the world would be visited with sorrow, distress, devastation. Malachi states this in fact in the following words, For behold, a day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. When Moroni was explaining this verse to Joseph Smith, he quoted it with a little variation for what is given. The lines that were changed read as follows. And all that do wickedly shall burn a stubble, for they shall come, for they that come shall burn them. 
This verse in question is alluded to in the Doctrine and Covenants at least three times. And in every instance, the Lord explains it as having to do with judgments to be poured out upon the wicked at the time of his second advent. The NC 64, 23, and 24 is a good illustration. Quote, Behold, now it is called today until the coming of the Son of Man. Verily, it is a day of sacrifice and a day for the tithing of my people. For he that is tithed shall not be burned at his coming. For after the day cometh the burning. This is speaking after the man of the Lord. For verily I say, Tomorrow all the proud and they that do wickedly shall be as stubble, and I will burn them up, for I am the Lord of hosts, and I will not spare any that remain in Babylon. Theodore, Elder Theodore M. Burton said, When Malachi prophesied of the second coming of Christ, he spoke of the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly. Of whom was he speaking? First, of those who rejected Christ because of the pride of their hearts, and secondly, of those who, having accepted Jesus, were not valiant in keeping his commandments. Malachi went on to say that they shall burn a stubble. This means that they shall be destroyed. By whom? Malachi, Malachi explains, they that come shall burn them, saith the Lord of hosts. End of quote. The prophet then turns from the happy state of the wicked and gives in some figurative language a picture of the fortunate situation of the righteous. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness rise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be as ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Malachi 4, 6, Elijah and the promises made to the fathers. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. When the angel Moroni quoted this part of Malachi, he did so with some changes as follows. Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises, and the promises made to the fathers, and the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. If it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. Sidney B. Sperry wrote, The mission of Elijah was to do was to do with the higher spiritual functions of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Elijah was the last prophet to hold the keys of the sealing powers of the priesthood, that is, to seal in heaven what is bound upon the earth. The spirit of Elijah implies the power to invoke the fullness of priesthood. The prophet Joseph Smith stated it in this way, quote, The spirit, power, and calling of Elijah is that ye have power to hold the keys of the revelations, ordinances, oracles, powers, and endowments of the fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood and the kingdom of God on earth, and to receive, obtain, and perform all the ordinances belonging to the kingdom of God, even unto the turning of the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers, even those who are in heaven. End of quote. Malachi 4, 6, Elijah and the promises made to the fathers continued. Through the powers of the priests given to Elijah, men and women may be sealed to each other in marriage for time and eternity in the temples of God. Children born to these unions may be claimed, may be claimed by their parents forever, since the latter are united by an everlasting covenant. The family organization thus continues beyond the grave, and one generation is thus sealed to another back to the days of Adam. Families that have passed into the spirit world without a knowledge of the gospel, and hence without being sealed to each other, must have the work done vicariously for them in the temples of the Lord. All of the gospel ordinances that are necessary to be performed for the living person to obtain salvation must also be performed for the dead. The Lord has made no exceptions other than for children who die under the age of eight years. That is the reason why fathers, the dead, spoken of Malachi 4, 6, turn to their children, their living descendants, to have all the gospel ordinances from baptism to marriage performed by carelessly for them in the temples. If the children do not turn their hearts to their ancestors and form this necessary work for them, it will make it impossible for the Lord to accomplish his purposes of making this earth the celestial abode of the righteous. Blessed are the meek, said the Savior, for they shall inherit the earth. 
In consequence of default in performing the ordinance required, the only course left for the Lord would be to smite the earth with a curse. Joseph Smith stated, I wish you to understand this subject, for it is important, and if you will receive it, it is the spirit of Elijah, that we redeem our dead and connect ourselves with our fathers which are in heaven, and seal up our dead to come forth in the first resurrection. And here we want the power of Elijah to seal those who dwell on earth to those who dwell in heaven. This is the power of Elijah and the keys of the kingdom of Jehovah. President Joel Finley Smith taught, What was the promise made to the fathers that was to be fulfilled in the latter days by turning of the heart of the children to their fathers? It was the promise the Lord made through Enoch, Isaiah, and the prophets to the nations of the earth that the time would come when the dead should be redeemed. And the turning of the hearts of the children is fulfilled in performing the vicarious temple work in the preparation of their genealogies. Commenting on the meaning of turning hearts, Joseph Smith said, Now the word turn here should be translated bind or seal. But what is the object of this important mission? Or how is this to be fulfilled? The keys are to be delivered. The spirit of Elijah is to come. The gospel to be established. The saints of God gathered. Zion built up. And saints to come up as saviors on Mount Zion. The sublime mission of Elijah to return and restore the keys of this power before the great and just for the day of the Lord was fulfilled on April 6, April 3, 1836, when he appeared to Joseph and Oliver Cowdery in their Kremper Temple. Here is their description of that notable appearance. Elijah the prophet, who was taken to heaven without tasting death, stood before us and said, Be told the time has fully come, which was spoken of by the mouth of Malachi, testifying that he, Elijah, should be sent before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Come, turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the children to the fathers, lest the whole earth be smitten with a curse. Therefore the keys of this dispensation are committed into your hands, and by this you may know that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is near, even at the doors. Doctrine and Covenants 2, 1 through 3. Behold, I reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and gentle day of the Lord. And he shall plan in the hearts of the children the promises made to the Father, and the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. If it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. If we do not have eternal families and sealed eternally, and live with our families eternally, then it was a waste of time. This whole earth life is a waste of time. Without the sealing powers of God that Elijah brought to the earth, this mortal experience would have been an utter waste of time, brothers and sisters. Therefore, if we do not ever go to the temple and get these ordinances performed for ourselves and our ancestors, then we are wasting our time. Third Nephi chapter 26, verses 1 through 7. Jesus informed the Nephite audience that the Father had commanded him to give them these prophecies that were not contained in their scriptures, that they should be given unto future generations. Using the words of Isaiah and Malachi as his preface, the Savior then proceeded to expound all things to the people. From the beginning, through the winding up scenes of the world's mortal existence, Mormon included an abridgment account of a lesser part of Jesus' teachings, which we have in the Book of Mormon. The Savior's teachings were so extensive that a hundredth part of them could not even be recorded. I'm sorry, that should be B, not He. That would be recorded in the Book of Mormon. This statement of Mormon reminds us that we that what we have is merely an abridgment of many volumes of records kept throughout Nephite history. Chapter 26, verse 4, judged of their works. John the Revelator saw mankind judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. While there may be many books, both earthly and heavenly in nature, involved in the judgment process, the Book of Mormon seems to emphasize the prim primacy of specific books as standards of judgment. The Lord told Nephi that out of the books he commanded that men should 
right. In other words, the scriptures. I will judge the words of every man according to their works, according to that which is written. This and other passages testify of the relationship between the scriptures and the works of each person. We are judged by our works according to that which is written, by measuring how well our lives, our thoughts, words, and deeds correspond to those principles, laws, and ordinances that the Lord has revealed in the scriptures. Thus the scriptures become the standard of judgment of which all mankind will be judged according to their works. Even though there are perhaps billions of people who have never been exposed to or given opportunity to learn from the scriptures and mortality. In the spirit world, they will all be taught the everlasting gospel is contained in the holy scriptures. Hence, all people will have full opportunity to learn of and either accept or reject the laws and principles, ordinances, and commandments that the Lord has revealed to man and commanded to be written in the books. It is in this ultimate sense that the scriptures become the books out of which mankind will be judged, both here and hereafter, according to their works. Ultimately, all people, their deeds, desires, thoughts, actions, and so forth, will be judged or balanced against the standards that are recorded in the scriptures, the standard works. 26 verse 5, if they be good to the resurrection of everlasting life. Jesus spoke of two resurrections, both among the Nephites and among the Jews. The first resurrection being with his resurrection and will continue through the millennium until all celestial and terrestrial persons are resurrected. Even within the first resurrection, there is a sequence. Some refer to this as the morning of the first resurrection and the afternoon of the same. The scriptures speak in terms of trumps being sounded that call forth the resurrected celestial saints, and then another trump being sounded that calls forth those of a terrestrial nature. At the end of the millennium, the last or second resurrection, the resurrection of damnation being encompassing those who inherit a telestial glory. This culminates with the resurrection of the sons of perdition who remain filthy still. 26 verses 8 through 11. These things have I written, which are a lesser part of the things which he taught the people. Mormon informs us that he had been going to include in his record all the marvelous teachings of the Savior gave to the multitude that are recorded in the large library of the Nephite records, known as the large place of Nephi, but that he was forbidden of the Lord. I will try to face my people, the Lord said. That is not some cruel game that God lays with mankind. It is rather an act of love and mercy for us, for our own sake, our spiritual development and salvation. The Savior expects us to develop faith and righteousness by trusting in and following the teachings of the portions of his word that has already been revealed, as in our standard works and in the words of the prophets and apostles of our dispensation. He desires to study, ponder, pray about, and heed those teachings we have so that we will desire more and be spiritually prepared to have greater things manifest to us. Without such spiritual readiness for those greater things, we would be utterly, we would be under great condemnation because we could not abide that which he has already revealed. Just as there will be many more church members, families, wards, stakes, and temples, later on there will be also many more nourishing and inspiring scriptures. Elder Neil A. Maxwell declared, Quote, however, we must first feast worldly upon which we already have. The Savior, like Mormon, desired that we may learn from the, and rejoice in those exquisite teachings that he gave to the Nephites. But he also knows that receiving something without effort will mean nothing. Only as we are prepared and hungering and thirsting after those words, having gleaned all we can from what we have, will those things be revealed, and we too will be able to bask in their radiating light. For I, God, will give unto the faithful line upon line, precept upon precept, and I will try you and prove you herewith. End of quote. President Spencer W. Kimball taught that before obtaining greater manifestations or additional scripture, we must read and believe what the, has already been revealed. Quote, I have had many people ask me through the years, when do you think we will get the balance of the Book of Mormon records? And I have said, how many in the congregation would like to read this whole portion of the plates? And almost always there is a 100% response. And then I asked the same congregation, how many of you have read the part that has been opened to us? And there are many who have not read the Book of Mormon, the unsealed portion. We are quite often looking for the spectacular, the unobtainable. I have found many people who want to live the higher laws when they do not live the lower laws. End of quote. 
chapter 26, 14 through 16. He did teach and minister unto the children of the multitude of whom he has spoken, and he did loose their tongues. After teaching and expounding to the multitude the great doctrines of the kingdom, Jesus ministered and blessed the children. So great was the spiritual outpouring, and so great his love and compassion for the little children, that he did loose their tongues, and they uttered marvelous things that Mormon described as even greater than Jesus had revealed unto the people. One can scarcely imagine such deeply and spiritual and profound things being ushered by little children. We are left to conjecture about their message. Was the veil parted to allow them to speak of life in the first estate? Did they discourse upon life among the gods in a celestial environment? Did they reveal doctrinal mysteries which today's world cannot receive? Such an event epitomizes that which the prophet Joel prophesied, albeit of a later time. Joel said, and it came to pass afterwards, I will pour out my flesh, my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Chapter 26, verse 17, to baptize and to teach as many as did come. We usually speak of the conversion process in terms of teaching and then baptizing. This is a correct part of the sequence, but it also appears that the teaching properly continued even after the ordinance had been performed. One of the primary missions of the church is the perfecting of the saints. This mission is carried out through continual instruction, fellowshipping, and ministering to those who have already been taught and baptized. Some truths are only grasped and appreciated after the conferral of the gift of the Holy Ghost. Chapter 26, verse 19, And they taught and did minister one to another. It was not just the twelve disciples who did the ministering teaching. It is the responsibility and blessings given to each member of the church to teach one another the doctrines of the kingdom. We learn and are edified not just from, sorry, that's not front, that should be from. From being taught, but also from having to study, ponder, prepare, pray, prepare, and teach one another. We are strengthened in fellowship, not just from being served and succored, but also from serving and ministering to the needs of one another. The spiritual blessings of the gospel transforms lives as much as being shared as from being received. Chapter 26, verse 19. They had all things common among them, every man dealing justly one with another. This phrase speaks as much of the righteousness and attitudes of these Nephite saints as it does of any temporal financial practice. They were filled with and motivated by the Spirit which leadeth to do good, yea, to walk justly, to walk humbly, to judge righteously. Having all things common under some form of consecration means little in and of itself and will always fail unless the attitudes of dealing justly and of adhering to principles of righteousness underlie the temporal implementation of the law of consecration. Because of the spiritual manifestations they had experienced, because their hearts had been cleansed by the power of the Holy Ghost, the practice of having all things in common, being united as it was the city of Enoch, in the bonds of consecration and stewardship, became a natural byproduct. Because they were filled with the pure love of Christ and had saintly compassion for their fellow man, because they honestly sought for what was best for each other, every man seeking the interest of his neighbor and doing all things with an eye single to the glory of God, they lived in peace and harmony. These attitudes and attributes and temporal blessings that flowed therefrom thus become the foundation for the Zion society and prosperity that, pre that later prevailed. Chapter 26, verse 21 they were called the Church of Christ. Another word for church could be fold or even family. By taking the name of Christ upon us, through these gospel ordinances, we come into the fold of Christ. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, we are born again and become members of his family. All of these requirements ensure membership in the earthly Church of Christ. But when coupled with continued faithfulness and valiance in the testimony of Jesus, as well as the ordinance of exaltation found in the temples, we become members of the heavenly Church of Christ, the Church of the Firstborn. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for watching. Hopefully this helps with some of the doctrines and principles in these chapters and help you to better come unto Christ. If it did help, please hit the like button.